All right, and we back on the forecast. Now, what we have to understand, living in the system, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you believe. That's why it's important for us to put our tribalisms and our beliefs to the side so we can do what we have to do. But in this system, it doesn't matter if you're a woman, if you're an elder, if you're a kid. They still treat you with that same harshness, that same brutality. They still see us all as the same. In Chicago, a young 18-year-old brother, Roshad McIntosh, was shot and killed by the police. So let's see what made the Chicago police shoot this 18-year-old brother while he was running away. All right, sir, going back to the 24th of August, 2014, uh, what was your duty status? On duty. Two days after the shooting, the officer who killed Rashad McIntosh was interviewed by the Independent Police Review Authority, which is known as IPRA. Chicago PD hasn't identified the officer publicly, so we'll refer to him as Officer S. There is no video of the actual shooting, but Cynthia points out a surveillance camera with a view of the house where it happened. And this is the camera here. It's what captured it all. Cynthia and her lawyer were allowed to see the video at IPRA's office. This is the first time I'm seeing it. This is it. This is August 24th, 2014, the day of the shooting. What time did you begin your shift? 1900. It's 7 p.m. Officer S is about to start his shift when he says a gang enforcement officer comes into the office with a tip that there are two guys somewhere on this street who have guns. So they drive to the location. We pull up in front of bulk. There's approximately 10 people standing on the sidewalk. When you arrived, how was the lighting in the area? In daylight. And uh, how about the weather? Hot, clear. I see how she uh, say to somebody, hey, come here, and I see a male flee what about. Officer S runs after him, and here we lose them. We don't have any footage of the actual shooting. I immediately run west. The man runs uh, through a gangway on lot. the left side of the house, while Officer S runs on the right side through an empty lot and reaches an alley in the back. I see this offender that I saw run from officers we in the dark shirt, male black with dreads, appear up out of the gangway. It's a couple steps to come up, um, holding a silver handgun in his right hand. Uh, seeing that he had a gun, I drew my weapon, uh, announced my officer as police, told him to stop. He saw me um, coming up out of the gangway. He turned right and went up onto the porch. He goes up the porch and moves to his left. I approach him through the yard. Uh, I get to within 10, 15 feet of him, uh, verbal direction, it's drop the gun, drop the gun, drop the gun. Uh, he has a gun pointed at me in his right hand. At that time, I fired my weapon in fear of my life. All right. Um, and was he saying anything to you? He did not say a thing. Okay. Less than 15 minutes into his shift, Officer S shoots the black man he says, pointed a gun at him. The black man Cynthia Lane would later identify as her 19-year-old son, Rashad McIntosh. About a year later, IPRA would find that the use of deadly force was objectively reasonable and within policy. Rashad, the report said, posed an immediate threat to Officer S's safety. IPRA did not recommend disciplinary action against the officers, and the Cook County State Attorney did not file criminal charges. So according to the police, an informant said that two men on the block where all those people supposedly had a gun. And I guess they would have just searched everybody and violated everybody's Fourth Amendment rights if the brother didn't take off running. But this brother Rashad McIntosh did take off running, which has been punishable by death since 1793 thanks to the Fugitive Slave Act. But the police initially said they saw this brother with a handgun as they chased him to the back porch. And Officer Robert Schlechter, the cop who fired the shots, said this brother pointed the gun right at him and disobeyed his orders so he had no other choice but to open fire. Of course, he feared for his life. And of course, the cops got on cold. 
And another cop, Officer Patrick Browery, said he saw him point the gun at him. And another cop, Officer Surratt Sample, and he's Asian and Pacific Islander mixed or something like that. But he said he was 15 to 20 feet away and he saw everything. He said he saw his brother Rashad McIntosh point his gun. And they said they found a 9mm at the scene. But they didn't even have his fingerprints on the gun. And they didn't even trace the gun to see where it came from. But the police were saying it doesn't matter. Just because his fingerprints not on it doesn't mean he wasn't holding it. And you even have eyewitnesses that said he didn't have a gun. But of course the police said those witnesses aren't credible. The only witnesses they said were credible happened to be the nameless, faceless witnesses that agreed with the cop story. And those were the only ones they put in the file. And despite whatever the evidence says, it goes without saying that they justified this shooting. It's what it's open field at, right here. What, you see where them people's at? Uh -huh. That's how it was the night when he got killed. So this is where it happened, Miss Cynthia? Yes, yes. Cynthia was at a barbecue when she heard Rashad was shot. As soon as she got to the scene, word had already spread of what happened to Rashad. And she says that what she heard didn't match the officer's statements. The one thing Cynthia and the officers agree on is how the narrative starts. Rashad was hanging out in front of this house when officers arrived. You see three detective cars coming up, turning off California onto Polk real fast. And they just swooped up in here and jumped out with their guns out on everybody. And uh, then my son, they said, supposedly took off and turned and ran through the gate and ran through the back way. So and that's where he, yeah, and, and he went way. end up back there. This is where the officer's story and Cynthia's story diverge. They say he came out on his knees with his hands way up. Please don't shoot, don't shoot, I don't got none. And he coming down on his knees, begging for his life, and he shot and killed them anyways. These aren't just minor discrepancies. The difference between the officer's story and Cynthia's story is the difference between a justified shooting and an unjustified one. Cynthia filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Chicago, alleging that the killing of her son was unlawful and that officers conspired with one another to cover it up, something the city of Chicago denies. I needed to talk to someone who was there that day. So I went back to the scene in June and started knocking on doors, hoping to find someone who saw the shooting firsthand. I'm Rosa, very Hi, nice too. These two men didn't want to appear on camera or tell their story to the police because they say they're afraid of police retaliation. Well, during the, that time, we was playing cars on the lot. Remember the empty lot Officer S ran through to get to the backyard? Both witnesses say they were right here, playing cards in full view of the back porch and the shooting. One of the young guys jump up and run through the gangway. Police take chase. He, I'm looking at him. He come up the stair with both of his hands on the balance, pulling himself up. So he couldn't have had a gun in his hand is he using both hands on the banister. That officer that came back here was standing right here. He had this gun pointing through the banister. And we were standing right here. So I told him, I said, don't shoot him, man. I said, I can get him down. I walked over and, and, and told him to come from up here before they, before they kill him. And you can see he was scared. I can see that in his eyes. That's why I told him, come from up there before they shoot you down, man. First he shot two times. I hear the bullets hit the wall. The cop told him to come out after he fired the first two rounds. He said, I'm coming out. So the cop said, come out with your hands up. And he put his hands out, and when he stepped out, he shot him. Did the police ever say, drop the gun? No. Because that's no. what the documents say, no. that the police say, <laughs> drop the gun, drop the gun. No, I didn't hear, hear no police say, drop no gun. He told him, come out with your hands up. You know, to see someone shot down in front of your face like that, an unarmed kid, you know, for no reason. You just shot a young boy for nothing. A young black man. Now, did the police interview either of you? No. About what you saw? No. All the police did was put us out the lot and out the alley. Now, after they justified the shooting, they didn't realize it was caught on a security camera. The actual shooting wasn't caught on camera, but it caught enough to contradict the cops so much that two of them had to change their story. It turns out Officer Surratt Sampin, the Asian and Pacific Islander cop, 
He said he was 15 to 20 feet away, but he was never that close. He was still on the front. And after the video came out, he changed the story and said he didn't actually see what happened. But he said he did see him have a gun. Even though the witness said he never heard the cops yell gun. And another cop initially said he never saw a gun. After the video came out, he changed his story. He said he did see a gun. But after so many contradictions and the independent police review authority who investigated the case got dissolved for being so biased and it probably had to be bad for them to be dissolved. But even though the police still are caping, they decided to reopen the case. There are conflicting stories about what happened on August 24th. So is somebody lying? Did Rashad have a gun? And if he did, did he point it at a police officer? These are the key questions that would unravel this whole case. The answers aren't quite so simple. Six officers told Ipra they either saw Rashad point a gun at Officer S or saw it on the porch after Rashad was shot. But in her lawsuit, Cynthia claims the officers conspired to file false reports and that it's not the first time police officers have covered for each other in Chicago. Unlike the Laquan McDonald case, there's no dash cam footage of the back porch where Rashad was shot. So I wanted to investigate Rashad's shooting myself. We're headed to IPRA. That's the Independent Police Review Authority. We actually obtained the full accounts, the interviews with the police officers. I got reams of records obtained from IPRA, the police, the medical examiner, basically from every government agency involved in the IPRA investigation. You see, in my experience, people can lie. People can make things up, but if you look closely enough, you can find clues in the paperwork that lead to the truth. If we do the math, we received 104 photographs in the first disc. This email says that there's an additional 16 And sure enough, I had several big questions after I looked through the documents. The first one, the sergeant. The sergeant tells Ipra investigators there are three cars in the police caravan and that he's the driver of the third car. That's him right there. And then Rashad runs. The sergeant then jumps in his car and says he goes around the block through an alley to get to the back of the house. His statement says, as I was driving eastbound down the alley, I heard three to four gunshots. I slammed on my brakes and exited my vehicle. As he's running towards the porch, he says he heard officers yelling, drop the gun, drop the gun. The sergeant runs into the yard after Officer S has shot Rashad. Now, let's go through that again and pay close attention. There is the sergeant. He says he was in the back alley when the shots were fired, slammed on his brakes and got out of his car. Now look carefully. This is the sergeant driving away. And look here, see how everyone ducks? This appears to be when the shots are fired. The timestamp on the video matches the time of the shooting on the police report. Two law enforcement experts agree. The sergeant is still here, not in the back alley close to the back porch where the shooting happened, right here in front of the house. He doesn't slam the brakes and doesn't get out of his car. It's a glaring inconsistency, but does it put into question the sergeant's entire account of what happened? Okay, so. And I also noticed this. This is video number three. This is one of the videos we got from IPRA. It came on a disc with no description, so I didn't know what to expect. There's a scene. This is the gangway Rashad ran through. Wait, that means he's on the porch right there, isn't he? This remains the only footage we have of the porch that day. There's the white cap. This is a different vantage point. There's the gun.
there is a gun at the scene. You Did know, Rashad own a gun? No, never. That's what I'm saying. Never own a gun. Never. I didn't allow that, you know, in my house or none of that. And then there's this. We asked Ipra if they had traced the gun, which would tell us who bought it and where. But they told me they had no documentation showing the gun was traced. We also wanted to know if Rashad's fingerprints were on the gun. And when we looked at the analysis by Illinois State Police. When they examined them, they reveal no latent impressions suitable for comparison. If that's the case, if Rashad was holding the gun at the time of the shooting, I would guess that there would be some fingerprint of him on, on the weapon. I even reached out to the paramedics. They treated Rashad at the scene, and I wanted to ask them if they saw a gun on the porch that day. I tried calling. And your brother was the paramedic at the scene. But they never returned my phone calls. Now, even though they reopened the case, they still weren't telling the family anything. And they did try to criminalize this brother, but he didn't have a violent past. He had no gun history. He had no gang history. So they can only criminalize him so much. Meanwhile, the cop, Sarah Sampin, he does have a history with misconduct, including one excessive force case on a minor. He hit him repeatedly with a gun. He pepper sprayed him. He beat him up. And then he poured mop bucket water on his head. This cop said, tell him where the guns and drugs are or he's going to jail. And then when the guy asked the cops for some water, they offered him a cup of boric acid. Then they arrested him anyway. Other cops at the department had to send him to get medical attention. Then he had another case where he ran in this dude's apartment. He tased him. He kicked his mom in the face. He shot his dog. And then said if he don't tell him where the drugs and guns are, they were going to take his sister away. The cop, Officer Robert Schleckler, the one who fired the shots, he also has a history of misconduct. Him and another cop violated a black woman. A female cop strip searched her while the other male cops were watching. The woman only had on a t-shirt and they made her bend over and spread her cheeks. Then the woman cop lifted her shirt up and lifted her bra up while the other male cops were watching. And even though they didn't find any drugs on her, they still arrested her and filed a false police report on her. But it doesn't matter if he was 79 or 19. It doesn't matter if he's an elder or if he's a little kid. We live in a system that sees us all as the same. The exact same thing happened to a 12-year-old little boy, Deonta Terrell Farrell. Before Tamir Rice, the Arkansas police shot this little kid down. The cop, Officer Eric Samish, said he was on a stakeout when he saw a suspect talking about this 12-year-old little kid who appeared to have a gun. And when this young brother, Deontay Farrell, didn't follow those almighty commands from the cop, he said he feared for his life and shot and killed this 12-year-old kid only to find out after he shot him that it was a toy gun. But of course, a trained cop wouldn't know the difference between a toy and a real gun. Now, these are just two little boys coming from the store, walking down the street with chips and soda, when two undercover cops jump from behind a dumpster, and within seconds, a 12-year-old boy is laying on the ground shot. The cops even tried to say he made a move, but why would you make a move with a toy gun? And there are witnesses that say he didn't even have a toy gun. They only had chips and a soda. But of course, they justified it. Our kids walking down the street with a soda or an Arizona iced tea pose a threat to the cops. So much so, it can get them killed. And these are cops that have been trained and retrained over and over again. Every time somebody's killed, they have a training session and call it a day. But this will continue to happen until we stand up for ourselves. Until them harming us, especially our children, means more to us than whatever our beliefs is. And the only way that'll happen is if we put aside our tribal differences and do what we have to do. One more thing stood out to me. When was your dating appointment to the Chicago Police Department? January 3rd, 2005. Okay. Um, did you observe a firearm? Did I? No, I did not see a firearm. Okay. Um, did... After a pause in the recording, the IPRA investigator resumes questioning the officer. Where were you when the uh, you heard the shots fired? I was in the gangway behind the door. Okay. 
did you ever uh, approach on the porch? No. Okay. Did you observe a firearm of any type? From my view from the backyard, no, I could not. All I could see was the suspect on the porch, so I could see his body face down. Okay. Couldn't see anything else on the porch. Okay. In your eyes, does that mean anything significant? No, because he again reiterates he didn't see a firearm. So it's not like he changed his testimony in any given This is Art Roderick. He's a former U.S. Marshal. We asked him to look at IPRA's investigation as a law enforcement expert since Chicago PD doesn't comment on pending litigation. He says that pretty much everything that happened that day appears to be standard procedure. So what I saw here is what I used to do every day for basically 25 years. He bolts. Now why is he running? What's in his head? I have a handgun. Very possibly. I mean, allegedly. Allegedly, he, he had a allegedly, he has a handgun. I look at that too. I mean, what was in his head when the police pulled up? We checked with local authorities to see if Rashad had previous gun charges and found he had three unrelated arrests. But Chicago police arrest records show he had not been arrested with a gun and had no gang affiliations. Something Chicago PD confirmed. How quickly the officers pulled their guns was something that seemed alarming to me, too. He's withdrawing his weapon at 7.09.52 as he's exiting. But Art didn't make much of it. If you remember the initial call that came in, two individuals with guns. Mm -hmm. It's not a call of somebody selling drugs on the corner. It's a call for two individuals carrying some pretty deadly weapons. So immediately I would come out with a handgun. For most of the questions I had, Art had a possible explanation. Remember how I wondered about the lack of fingerprints on the gun? I kind of dispute that. Okay. It so just please, says, that, please yeah, it says, it says me. none could be lifted. Okay. That doesn't mean there wasn't any fingerprint. They could have been smeared. They could have been mm -hmm. rubbed based on who knows what happened. Uh, it would be different if it said it was wiped clean. And while these two men who say they witnessed the shooting say Rashad was killed for no reason. Uh, eyewitnesses, I'm always very leery of them until you can corroborate it with other eyewitness statements. You could put 10 of them witnessing something and you might get 10 different versions of what actually occurred. But what about the sergeant's account? There are the three cars. There he is. There's the sergeant. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see these people react to those gunshots here in the next few seconds. There mm -hmm. it is. There's the sergeant's car. He's in the front, not in the back. I mean, his statement is definitely incorrect if he's saying that he was in the alley at the time of the at the time of, that he heard the shots. Mm -hmm. Which is what his statement says. What he clearly says, though, is I did not see the shooting. Right. I heard the shots. I mean, you got to realize police are human beings. These are the inconsistencies I would hope to find. Really? You yes. would hope to find these type of inconsistencies? I would hope to find these types of inconsistencies. If all of the police officer accounts... Said exactly the exactly same thing, I would be... Something's not right. Every witness noted in the police report says they either didn't see the shooting at all or corroborated Officer S's story, that Rashad had a gun. But their names are redacted on the report we got from the police, so we couldn't talk to them ourselves. Like one witness who says Rashad showed him a silver gun half an hour before the shooting, just before he walks into frame here. After that, we see Rashad cross the street with friends. We see him sit on a stoop. We see him talk to someone in this green van. Another witness says he saw Rashad try to hide a gun in his pocket after Rashad ran into the backyard. But it's unclear if the witness saw the shots being fired because he says he crouched down and ducked after he heard someone yell, gun, gun. So after we did that initial interview mm -hmm. with you, I went back and looked at every police officer account. And I a month after our interview with Art, I mapped out what each officer told Dipra about the day Rashad was killed and noticed that one more officer wasn't where he said he was. We'll call him Officer P. Officer P told Dipra investigators he was the passenger in the second car in the caravan, that he ran through the empty lot to a pickup truck, 
that was right here in the middle of the lot. Then he says he saw Rashad point a silver pistol at Officer S, that Officer S fired three shots and that Rashad fell down in the patio. Now, here's Officer P, and here is when the shots were fired. He is clearly not in the middle of the lot by the pickup truck. He's in front of the house on the sidewalk. This is the view from there. I I see. Art and another law enforcement expert reached the same conclusion. You brought up a very, very interesting point. It appears there's some definite question as to his, the truthfulness of his statement. What does this police officer's account do to the overall investigation? It, it taints it. There's a saying out there that we use that you can't make a bad shooting good, but you can make a good shooting bad. And I think this is a case of making a good shooting look bad. To me, based on the stuff that we've seen already, I still go back to where did that gun come from? It strikes me as odd that they wouldn't do an ATF trace on that weapon. It's just like policing 101. I think a reinvestigation of the overall shooting is definitely warranted. I've been pushing the Cook County State Attorney's Office and IPRA about the lingering question our investigation uncovered. Why are there no records of the gun being traced? What about the sergeant? What about Officer P? How could they close the case when there were so many questions left unanswered? IPRA has faced criticism in the past. About a year after Rashad's death, a local government watchdog found that of the 400 police shootings IPRA investigated since 2007, only one of those shootings was deemed unjustified. IPRA was deemed so badly broken by the city of Chicago, it was reorganized and renamed COPA in 2017. In July, three weeks after my initial email, I heard back from the Cook County State Attorney's Office, who said they had no intention of reopening the criminal investigation into Rashad's shooting. And then in August, I get an email. Remember the wrongful death lawsuit that Cynthia Lane filed against the city of Chicago? One day before the release of this documentary, we got the transcripts of eight depositions from the city of Chicago from 2015 and 2016 of the officers who were at the scene of the shooting. My team and I read through them. And it appears the dots are reporting connected line up. In these transcripts, the sergeant and Officer P have walked back some of the prior statements they made to IPRA, and they've acknowledged, after viewing the video that contradicted their earlier accounts, that they weren't where they said they were. Officer P said his timing was a bit off, that he was not in the empty lot when the shots were fired. And while he still said in his deposition that he was looking at Rashad, he now says he didn't see Rashad fall on the porch after all. And the sergeant said that he misjudged where he was. And remember the one officer who said he didn't see a gun on the porch? Now he says that he did see a gun on the porch that day.